ask that you would come and that you would fill this place with your presence. Lord, we're asking that you move in a mighty way this morning. We love you. We give you honor and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Do you praise the Lord this morning? Yes. All right. We are glad to be in the house of the Lord. You're able to be seated if you can be. So we just want to welcome you to Little Chapel this morning. And if you're new, we'd love to give you more information about Little Chapel Church. So if that's the case, please text the word welcome, W-E. L C O M E. That was hard to spell. Uh, so <laughs> spell it correctly, I guess, and text that to 618 777 6779 for more information. All right. The next baptism service is going to be on March 28th. Um, today is the last day to sign up, and you can sign up um, at the, on the app, on the website, or at the Welcome Center today. But remember, today is the last day. Okay. Newcomers Lunch coming up March 28th, immediately following the Sunday service. Uh, so please sign up on the app, the website, or at the Welcome Center. But we want you to be involved in that. Okay, um, they are in need. We are in need of more kids volunteers. Um, it's such a such a good thing as people are coming back to connect classes more. Um, that means there's more kids that need taken care of. I just came from there. It's a blast. Um, watching babies boss other babies around. It's super fun. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, okay, so the, the specific needs they have, um, third grade, connect class, Sunday school teacher. Um, you can do this by yourself. You can do it in a team. You can grab a friend or two friends, um, but that is a need that, that we need filled. Um, also, we need um, nursery volunteers during connect class and for the Sunday morning service. That's awesome. Please be involved in that. It's a great way to serve. So uh, Easter's coming up. We're going we're gonna to do a family sunrise service at 630 in the morning. It's an awesome place to just come and worship the Lord with the sunrise because the sun is risen. Amen? Amen. Six people know that. So here at this Christian church, we believe that on that day, Jesus rose. Amen? Yes. Yes, all right. So, and actually, since it's a Christian church, we're going to follow that by breakfast. Amen. Yes. All right. So, you got to be a part of that. And then they're going to do an Easter egg hunt following the morning encounter service for all the kids pre K through fifth grade. So, it's going to be a great Sunday. Invite friends, invite family. It's going to be a wonderful time to just rejoice in the Lord. Amen. So last thing, and it's certainly not the least, we want you to be faithful in your giving, and we're just asking you uh, whatever way is easiest for you, please just continue to serve in that way. Uh, there's offering buckets located in the back at the end of every service and before. There's the app. There's the website. Uh, and this, uh, I need to make sure I announce this. So there's, you need to check to make sure your LCC app is updated so it links to the new giving provider and not the old one. So if you haven't done that, please do that. And then for our online audience, you're always welcome to mail as well. So let's just um, ask the Lord to be with us this morning. Is that okay? Would you stand with us? I'm just reminded even as we do this, and we're going to have these baby dedications and just so many blessings around us. You know, there's this story in the Old Testament of Moses, and he's walked by over and over and over again this bush as he's been this shepherd and it's this dark time in the soul as he's been kind of in exile. And, and yet this one day, there's this bush that's on fire and it's not consumed. And he turns aside to see it and he hears God say, Moses, Moses. And you know the story. He says, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. And family, I'm, I'm just reminded in this place, you have walked into not just a building. You've been here before. But family, where two or three are gathered, he has a promise to us that says, I am there with you. And some of you need to just take the sandals of rep repetition off this morning and just recognize you are in the presence of the Holy One. You are in the presence of God. And even as we do these special moments with these babies, let us not take it as just another Sunday. But I, I just speak over this congregation. There is a day of newness that has arrived. There's a day of newness that has arrived. And so as we pray, let us just begin to usher in the presence of the Lord because guess what? Open your eyes. He is already here. He's already here. So, Lord, we welcome you. We welcome you. Lord, we see that you are here. We turn our affections to you. You are the God of miracles. You have given us Jesus, your son. You have saved us by your blood, Lord. And, Father, we look to you for all of our help and our need in this time of great need, Lord. And, Father, we just confess that even in the darkness as it comes, Lord, you are the light and you are our salvation and all that we need is in you, Lord. 
And so, Father, I just pray even now, God, as every giver gives, Lord, that you would return to them 30, 60, and 100 fold, Lord, as everyone is faithful to serve and to honor you, God, that in this time you would cause us to walk in the faithfulness of your presence and friendship, Lord, as you have promised. So come and be in our midst in a special way today, Lord, but we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor to come. If he's not already up here, here he is. Oh, man, we are so excited. Can, can I get all the families just to spread out in this bigger area up here? We've got a, uh, you know, one thing our church is really good at is doing what the Bible says when it comes to being fruitful and multiplying. Amen. Come on. You guys can be seated uh, as we just honor honor these families that are up here. Um, what a special time it is to to be able to come together. And, and as we're getting ready, I want to ask our elders that are present, will you please come up here and, uh, and find a family to pray for? So if you're an elder here with us, would you go ahead and begin to make your way up here and, uh, and just agree and partner with us in prayer over these families that are coming to, to give their children back to the Lord? Because how many of you know that, that our children are a blessing from God? Well, let me ask that again, just for everyone to, to kind of wake up a little bit. How many of you believe that your children are a gift from God? Amen. And what God, what God instructs us to do with the gifts that he has given us is to give them back to him. Oftentimes we see in scripture that whenever those who received gifts would turn them back over to the Father, he would touch them, bless them, and anoint them for his use. Remember the story of the boy with the, with the loaves and the fishes. That all he had was lunch, but he gave it to Jesus who received that gift, blessed it, and that gift that was touched by the master was utilized by God for his glory. And so that's what we see here with, with, with these families. They're, they're bringing these beautiful babies that God has blessed and gifted them with. They're bringing these children back to the Lord just as a symbolic act saying, God, here we are. Here are the children. Here are the blessings, the gifts that you gave to us. We acknowledge they are from you, and now we give them back to you so that your anointing, so that your touch would be upon our children. And we know that whenever you touch our gifts, they will be utilized for your glory in Jesus' name. The story of Hannah whenever she dedicated her son Samuel is, is one that I continually come back to during these dedication services. And I, and I just wanna turn around and talk to these families. And so, so we're just making this a personal thing that you all get to be a part of. And so families, as I am just talking to you in these moments, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas who are up here and out here, when Hannah brought Samuel to the Lord, it was, it was her response from a desperate heart that was just that cried out that the Lord would give to her a child, a son. And her, her cry was, Lord, if you give him to me, I will give him back to you. I will give him back to you. And so what we read in, in the scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, is the story of Hannah giving Samuel back to the Lord. And this is what it says. And when her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, then I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have him weaned. Only may the Lord make good on his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son till she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with three, a three-year-old boy, an epa of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli and said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. For his whole life he will be given to the Lord. 
That was Hannah's heart over her child, and I know that that is your heart over your boys and girls. For their whole life, they will be given to the Lord. The Word says that she prayed for her son. I know moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, you've prayed for your babies. You've prayed for your boys. You've prayed for your girls. Just really prayed for a boy. <laughs> And here we are, as a response of God's gift to you, you're bringing your gifts back to God. So parents, well done. Well done. Moms and dads, well done. Elders, as you are with these families right now, let's just begin to pray over them. Family, church family, this, um, this time is not just a, a time of uh, tradition or ceremony or anything that we do this is a this is a true act of obedience to God and many of you as I say every time that we do this as a body as a family because that's what we are many of you as these children go will have opportunity to bring influence into their life as a church family it is our it is our responsibility to come alongside parents and in impart into their children things of God, the teachings of the Lord. We are called to help hold children accountable as they are raised up in the knowledge of God right alongside their parents. And so as a church, moms and dads, we want to partner with you. So as an act of partnership, would you, our body, extend a hand and begin to pray over these babies and over these families right now. Just begin to speak out over them and just begin to pray, hope, prophesy words of, of a future in accordance with what God has said. Let's just take a moment and just begin to bathe them and cover them in prayer.
Well, church, I want to introduce to you, for those of you who might not know, we're going to start over here on this end, or on this end, sorry. We're going to introduce uh, Miss Kay Goey, and she is the daughter of uh, Clayton and Aaron. Both of them are kids of the house. It's good. What a pretty one. And next to them, we have, we have Wesley Johnson, and he is the son of Aaron and Asia. And right here in the middle, we have Bodie Knight. Bodie is the son of, of uh, Josh and Stacy Knight. And next to them, we have Hayden Martineau, and he is the son of Caleb and Rachel Martineau. Just beautiful little boy. And then on the end over there, we have Truett Moore, the son of Jess and Jessica Moore. Yes. Family, let's stand to our feet right now. Bless this families that have come and just honor them. Let's give them one more round of encouragement and applause. And let's worship the Lord together this morning.
for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord God lift our hands to the Lord this morning. Let's just begin to give him honor and glory. Lord, we were lost in our sins, and yet you made a way. Because you're worthy.
told the guys this morning and I really think that it's for today 
is this morning as I was in just a time of prayer, I got up really, really early this morning. I couldn't sleep. And there was this line in this song that was sung over, and I, and I just kind of fell in this moment that they were singing it over me. And I think that this may need to be expressed to you. And I hear one of my friends all the time say in this church that Jesus is just a lover who's looking for a lover. Do you guys understand that? He's a lover. He loves you. And he's looking for people to love him back. And this song said this morning that this really interesting thing that he said that the mercy surgeon is coming in to do surgery in the parts that we don't even know exist to remove the things that are holding us back from even more of his presence, to holding us back from where he's wanting to take us. And as we begin to sing this song as a declaration that Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. It's your name that's above every name. It's your name that can part the seas. It's your name that can move mountains. It's your name that can heal every disease. It's your name. It's, it's not my name. It's not TW's name. It's not a president's name. It's the name of Jesus who is above every name in heaven and in earth. And I believe this morning that the Lord is wanting to do surgery on some hearts, that the Lord is wanting to do surgery on some minds because he is so interested in your love. He loves you so much that he died on a cross for you. But more than that, he loves you so much that he wants to be your friend, that he wants to spend time with you. And so, Lord, this morning, I just pray that all over this place, that your presence as it's here would begin to sweep. Lord, that it would begin to do surgery on hearts and minds in this place. Lord, that it would reveal the truth of who you are to people in this place. That your heart would be revealed in this place. we're worshiping, I'm just, the word worthy, 
just keeps playing in my heart, the word worthy. And as we say so often that our king is worthy of everything that we offer. Not that we have anything that is of great value, but he's worthy of it all. He's worthy. And I was just telling Lord, yes, God, you are worthy. You are worthy. And where I felt like the Lord, I felt like I just heard the Lord speak to my heart that he wanted to individually speak to ones here who struggle with their own worth. You see, because he's worthy, it's because he's worthy that he's made you worthy. It's not based on anything that that you've done or that you could do. It's based solely upon who he is. I'm speaking even to those who you've tasted of the goodness of God. And then you believed a lie that somewhere along the line, because maybe there was a turning that, but and you're like, man, I'm not even worthy. I can't even, I, I'm not even worthy. I just, I feel so strongly that the Lord is just reaching. And he's saying, no, I've made you worthy. Because that's what he does. That's what he does. He is worthy. Jesus, in these moments, first I pray that you would reveal to each your worth, that we would see the worth of our King, the value of our Master. Even in a moment, God, open our eyes, just as As Brent said earlier, open our eyes to see the worth of your majesty. That we would see this one that we come to worship. That we would see the one that we we say we love. That we would see how worthy you are to receive everything that we would ever offer. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. Yes, God. Can you just tell him that he's worthy? Yeah. 
Jesus, for you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Jesus, be glorified. We thank you for this time where we have to be with you, to not just come and sing about you, to not to not just come and to, to be together, but to come and be with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace that you have abundantly poured out upon us. For your mercy, when we didn't deserve it, that you gave to us anyway. Jesus, you are good. You're worthy. And I thank you, Father, that your worth is an endless fountain that pours worth back into these vessels that are broken. And I thank you, Father, that it's, it's from realizing who you are that we live and move and have our being. So, Lord, I thank you that each one here, they would have their value instilled from the reality of who you say they are. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. You guys can be seated in his awesome presence. Oh, man. Hey, I want to uh, just jump right back into to where we have been, right? We're in this series, What Do We Do When Evil Surrounds? So the question is, what's our response whenever evil surrounds? This, um, I believe, is the... Uh, fourth week that we've that we've been into this so it's been a lot of fun so far and we're just going to keep going next week will be the kind of the serious conclusion and we got a special treat for you next week so you're not going to want to miss that I don't want to spoil the surprise but it's going to be a good one so um, everyone just get ready for next week but until then you have to endure this one in Jesus name come on somebody all right but uh, I'm excited about being able to speak to you again uh, I just want to go right back to where we opened uh, the scripture last week. So let's, uh, if we can, can we put that back on the screen? 1 John chapter 4, uh, 7 through 19. I want us to read this again because uh, this is where we are staying. This is the vein that we are in. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. Everyone say that. Love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. That's a, that's a fun one. You ever read something and then you read it again and you're like, oh man, there's some weight on that. Yeah, that's one of them, right? For he who does not love does not love God. Man, okay, we won't stay too long there. All right, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us loved us. 
All right. As we've said, we've, uh, we, we've kind of been just going through this series on, on first and foremost, we're recognizing the way that evil is surrounding. We're recognizing the, the propensity for evil that our world seems to be falling deeper and deeper into. But ultimately, uh, I, I want us to know that that is not a reason for believers, for followers of Christ to lose hope. Because how many of you know and can testify that our hope is not attached to what we see in the world, but we have a greater foundation, and that is a hope in Jesus Christ. He says, behold, I have overcome the world. So we are given this opportunity to choose to believe what God has said. So either we believe it and will attach our, our belief and our faith to his word, or we will find ourselves worried and struggling and fearful, saying, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Things are getting so crazy around here. How many of you guys know that God has a greater word? I'm going to ask this side, okay? How many of you guys believe that God has a greater word? If God has a greater word and we truly believe that, then we have the opportunity to hold on to what God has said. What God has said is truth, and what God has declared in truth, God desires to bring to pass. It is true. If he has said it, then he has given us the opportunity to partner with his word, to believe his word, and how many of you guys know that partnering with his word by believing in his word will lead to obedience to his word, which will produce to action from his word? We are called to move and live in obedience to the word of God, not allowing what we see to impact or influence what, 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 what is true, because there is a deeper truth. We're talking about this reality here that, that, that the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 13 Jesus said, is like yeast. We've talked about this a couple of weeks. And he talks, and Jesus is using this, uh, this, th this parable, uh, illustrating this greater truth, saying that whenever yeast is worked into the, it, it works its way in until the whole lump of dough is leavened. And what do we talk about? The fact that, that yeast, yeast makes everything better, Right? Yeast makes the dough better. Yeast fulfills a purpose, and yeast changes the structure and causes the bread to rise. Well, Jesus was teaching this parable in Luke chapter 15 or 13 to us who one day would read this over 2,000 years later. That's why I love the Word of God, because it is just alive today as it was when Jesus spoke it. Because Jesus is still speaking it, amen? He is the Word, right? Jesus is the Word, and his word was not just spoken, it was not just spoken over 2,000 years ago, but his word is still speaking today. So when Jesus is speaking to his disciples in these moments, he's also speaking to us this very moment. This very minute, this very minute, Jesus from his word is declaring over each and every one of you that you are the yeast of the kingdom. This is what he's teaching his disciples, that, that it's not just about the kingdom, this, 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 this metaphorical kingdom that's one day just, just going to influence. No, he's saying that the, that, that the kingdom of God in Luke 17 that he said is placed in you, right? The kingdom of God is in you, and you are in the world, not to be influenced by the world, but to influence the world around you. Therefore, you are the yeast of the kingdom worked in to the world in order to what? To make it better, to fulfill a purpose. Come on, and to change the structure of where God has placed you and cause it to rise. Man, that is, that is awesome, and that is good news. Tell somebody, that's good news. That's good news. It's good news. So how do we do it? We know that God wants to end this moment in these days that we are living in. We know that he wants to influence the world with his kingdom. We know, we believe I firmly believe that the church's best days are ahead of us. Come on, somebody. I believe that in this season that we are living, man, whenever it seems like it's getting darker, my goodness, that's just a greater opportunity for light to shine. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it. So I refuse to be discouraged about the things that I see because I am hope-infused. Come on, somebody. I am hope-infused knowing that he has a greater say. And so this is what I'm holding to. Yet we still have work to be done. We have work to do. 
God has called us to the yeast of the kingdom, therefore he's giving us responsibility to carry out his mandate every day that we live. What a privilege that you and someone like me every day could wake up and say, wow, God wants to use me. He wants to use me to do something today. What a benefit, man. That's just, that's just cool to think about, that the God of all creation would, would, would choose to use someone like us to do something for his glory. So how do we do it? How do we, how do we respond whenever evil surrounds? Well, we understand that we're not look, we don't have to look for this great big demonstrative act. We simply have to understand the principle of the yeast, that the yeast is small, yet it makes a big impact. The first thing that we talked about was the fact that Daniel, when evil surrounded, served well. Daniel served well. And da- so how did Daniel serve well? Well, just like I was speaking earlier, God gifted Daniel. God gave Daniel gifts to function and to use for the glory of God. And Daniel was able to take the giftings that God had placed in him and use those to serve the kings of a pagan, of a pagan culture and a pagan kings around him. Why? So that the influence of the kingdom would be made manifest to a king and that influence to a king would literally have the ability to touch the nation. Something so seemingly small as being able and willing to serve with the essence and flavor of the kingdom worked its way in to the heart of three kings, leading to favor resting upon Daniel, turning the hearts of kings towards the Lord and allowing and causing these kings to make these proclamations that the God of Daniel is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. If the Lord God can use the service of one to turn the hearts of kings and the ways of nations, what can God still do today? What could God still do today if we would choose to say, you know what, God, I believe that you're still wanting to do something. I believe that you still want to do something whenever it seems like evil surrounds. How many of you know that God is not stressed out by what we're seeing in the world today? He's not up there so, you know, having, a, having a meeting with Jesus and the Holy Ghost saying, hey, guys, what are we going to do? Have we thought about this? Do we have an action plan set up? Hey, bring in Michael and the other archangels and just tell them to get ready because we, we need to have a structural meeting set up to, to think about what's going to No, he's not worried. He's not. As he is. As he is, so we are to be in this world. That's what the Word says. So if God isn't stressed, why should we be? Because he has a greater plan. Will we choose to align our heart with the will of God? Come on. He's still moving. He's still working. And he has a great plan. Daniel served well. The the next thing we talked about, we began it last week, and it's what I'm going to attempt to finish this morning, is that we are called We are called to love well. So what do we do when evil surrounds? We love well. Remember last week we really dove into the overcorrection that we've seen and how and how so much of what we're seeing right now in this uh, and and, and even in the 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 talk about our our response to love, so much of what we see has been an overcorrection to where we have mistakenly appropriated love and acceptance and and made them uh, unilaterally uh, important. We've elevated love and we've elevated acceptance and say that the two are are mutual, that that they're they're the same thing. But friends, that's not the case. That's not the case. Love does not equate to blind acceptance. So what happens whenever whenever we we, we elevate this, this acceptance to be synonymous with love, we get to the point to where the church is no longer willing and the and, and followers of Christ are no longer uh, able for fear of offense to speak against sin, to talk about the importance of repentance, to let the world know that there is, that there is a heaven and by golly there sure is a hell and that there is an enemy who is out to deceive and to distract and to pull the world away from its creator. Friends, we cannot be deceived. We cannot value acceptance 
over love's responsibility. Love has a responsibility in that not, and that is not to blindly accept the whims and ways that the world wants to go and just say, well, I'm just trying to love well. So we've talked about, we began the discussion, what does love do? Love has attributes. Love has purpose. Love does certain things. And what we talked about last week was the fact that love pulls. Love pulls. It was the love of God that literally pulled us from a place of, 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 of hopelessness. It was the love of God demonstrated through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus upon the cross that literally reached down at our lowest point and pulled us out of the miry clay and set our feet upon the rock. It was the love of God that pulled us out of a life bound to sin and death and brought us into a life of hope and righteousness and holiness based on the reality of Christ Jesus. There's something more. See, love pulled us into something more. Love pulled us into the life that Jesus died that we would have. So as a follower of Christ, I need to understand that I'm called to love with that same type of love. Not a love that, that, that accepts all things, but a love that would be so compelling and so drawing that it would literally draw people into a deeper walk with Christ. Really, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't love, like the, the, the love of Jesus was not manifested in such a way that made a way for people to continue in a life of sin. No, Jesus, he did it really well. He loved the people who were in sin, but the love that Jesus had did not make a way for them to stay in sin. In fact, Jesus loved people so much, he called them away from the things that would distract or pull them from all that he had for them. Remember the rich young ruler? I'm sorry, I'm not even talking in my notes right now, but you just, just go with me, okay? Say, I'm coming. All right? The rich young ruler, he come to Jesus, and he said, what do I got to do? And Jesus gave him the list. Well, you know the commandments. Love your, you know, honor your mother and father. Do not lie. Da, da, and he gives him the whole list. And the rich young ruler, with a, with a haughty heart, said, well, I've done all these things. Look at me, Jesus. I've got it together. You know, I, 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 think that he was, I, I think he was just like looking for a pat on the back. He said, Jesus, I've done everything you've said. Certainly, I'm worthy of everything you have. <laughs> Is there anything else? Right? Have you guys ever had that type of attitude? Well, I did it. Is there anything else? I don't think the rich young ruler, I, I think that's kind of the attitude he was having in this moment. All these things I've done to my youth, since my youth. Is there anything else? And Jesus said, oh yeah, there is that one thing. Go sell all you have. Give it to the poor and then follow me. And one of the saddest verses in the Bible, I think, it personally, is this verse that says, and the rich young ruler, the young man went away sad, for he was one who had much wealth. You see, Jesus in his love for this man. You see, it wasn't, this wasn't Jesus pushing back and saying, dude, you, you, have, you are so far from figuring it out. No, Jesus was giving this one an invitation into following him the same way that he invited Peter, Andrew, James, Bartholomew, Philip, Nathaniel. He was giving him an invitation, a front row seat to the ministry and the life of Jesus. That's how much he loved this young man. He said, but I'm after the one thing. You see, the love of Jesus was not, is not given so that we could just say, oh, he loves me, Jesus loves me, this I know. Now I'll go live how I want. <laughs> nope. Jesus loved me so much that his love would put a pull on my heart that would pull me from a life and from things that would distract me or, or, or pull me away from all that he has for me. That's how his love works. Now, I will respond to that love. Now, I'm going to love others that way. My love towards others is not going to allow or make room for things that violate his heart but I'm going to love well. And love pulls. Love pulls. It draws others into something more. I want to move on this morning with the second thing that love does. Love purifies. Are you ready? This is going to be fun. 
I better pray before I start talking about this in Jesus' name. Father, help me. That's a good enough prayer right there. Help me, Lord. Help me speak your word with, with purpose and truth. Guard my lips. Lord, be glorified in these moments. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word as it goes forth. As good seed falling on fertile ground, producing fruit in our lives 30, 60, and 100 fold. In Jesus' name, amen. Love purifies. So if you're taking notes, if you're taking your notes, continuing on from last week, this would be point two. Love purifies. How about this one? This is fun. John chapter 2, 13 through 17. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep, doves and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with sheep and, and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. And his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. <laughs> There's a, uh, you know, you remember the old bracelets, you know, WWJD? You know, like I, I saw something one time that said, well, what would Jesus do? And then right under it, it said, uh, whipping people and flipping over tables isn't out of the question. Come on, I mean, I think that, you know, that's, that's just something fun to think about, right? Because Jesus loved, Jesus loved really well, but even in the love that Jesus demonstrated perfectly, because according to Colossians 1.15, that, that, that he was the image of the invisible God, right? Jesus literally, his life, his presence was the image, the exact representation of the Father, so in this moment that we read about, although that, yes, God is love, Jesus is loving, what, did he, what was his response whenever he was witnessing something that violated the heart of God? Jesus said, I'm not putting up with this. There was a purifying that took place when Jesus stepped in and witnessed something that was violating the Father's heart. There was a purifying that took place. And this is symbolic for what Jesus has done for us. You think about this, we are his temple, amen? We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus is coming to the temple, right? He sees the temple, a place that he loved, a place that he valued, a place that he cherished. And this place was meant for holiness. That's what the temple was. It was a place set apart for holiness. There were places that people could not enter by, except by once a year, and only that would be the high priest. It was the holy of holies. This place, the temple, was set apart for holiness. Jesus loved the temple. He loved the temple, and he comes in, and he sees sin and deceit violating that which God set aside to be holy. And what does he do? Jesus shows up and he passionately purifies that which was causing his temple to be unclean. Symbolism here. We, as I said, are his temple. Jesus, whenever he came in on the scene and he witnessed those things that were violating the heart of God, that is the issue of sin that every single one of us pre-Jesus was walking in and dealing with. Whenever he witnessed those things, he came in and there was a violent act of grace that purified a heart of stone and turned it to a heart of flesh. There's a purifying act that happens when Jesus comes. Why? Not because Jesus is mad at you, no, because Jesus loves you and he would say, I will do anything I can. I will go to the cross to purify that which God set aside to be holy. Just as the temple was set aside to be holy, you have been set aside to be holy unto God. And it's his love. Catch this. It's his love that purifies it's from his place of love that he purifies us. From the, from the place of love that he purified the temple. Love purifies, listen, it does not compromise. I'll say that again. Love purifies, it does not compromise. Real love, Christ-centered love, is sacrificial. It's not compromising. Sacrificial love, the sacrificial love of Christ 
expressed through the cross, gave those whom he loved a way into something better. Sacrificial love will lay down your desires for another's benefit. That's what sacrificial love does. Sacrificial love lays down one's desires for the benefit of another. Jesus, again, was the perfect demonstrator of that reality. That it was the love of Jesus, sacrificially, Jesus loved us enough that he laid down his own desires, right? Guys, remember in the, in the garden, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. I love that because it shows the reality of the humanity that Jesus chose to put on in himself. He chose to become flesh, and in his flesh he did not want to endure the cross, the shame, all of the things that would be produced, but, it was the, but his heart was demonstrated, but nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. That's sacrificial love. Why? What was the will of God? For all of us to be brought in back to a place of knowing God as Father. So sacrificial love laid down his own desires for the benefit of the world. For God so loved the world. Amen? That's sacrificial love. That's sacrificial love. That's not a compromising love. Sacrificial love, I'll say it again, will lay down your desires for another's benefit. Compromise will elevate others' desires over the standard of righteousness we've been called to. And sadly, this is what we see most of the time. Compromise will elevate others' desires, not benefit, others' desires over the standard of righteousness. Love that compromises is often based in fear or manipulation. Love that compromises often comes from being, uh, being in fear or manipulated, therefore lacking purity. You know, and we know examples of this, like, well, if you, if you loved me, then you would do this, whatever this might be. If you really loved me, then, if you really, if you really, really loved me, then you would meet my need. If you really loved me, then you would fulfill my desire. That's manipulating. That's manipulating love. And then those who respond to that type of manipulation, thinking, right, thinking, being manipulated, thinking that they're responding in love, really what's happening in these moments, really what's happening in these moments is they're being moved by fear. Doing things, listen, Doing things that violate your heart or d- d- that violate your heart for the sake of another is being moved by fear. That's not being moved by love. If, 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 if the motivation of your love is the fear of, of a response, guys, that's not really love. That's fear. Being loving based by fear means it looks like looking past or over things that do not align with righteousness. Not taking stands in accordance with righteousness, love, and truth because of the fear of offense. Right? There's a difference, guys. There's a difference in purifying love and a compromising love. Compromise does not usher in the kingdom. Compromise does not usher in the kingdom, and it does not produce kingdom change. Love. Love that purifies, love that challenges, love that is not swayed by manipulation or fear, that is the yeast of the kingdom being worked into families, being worked into marriages, relationships, cities, regions, states, countries. That's a love that produces change. The opening text, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Do you hear that? Fear involves punishment. So love that has been manipulated and expressed causes an expression or a response that is based from fear. Well, if I don't give in to desires, then. Am I making sense? Is anyone picking this up right here? 
This is not a purifying love. A purifying love holds to the standard of righteousness and holiness. A purifying love holds to a standard of righteousness and holiness and does not make excuse or compromise. And yet that's where we see, that's what we see a lot right now. We see a lot of compromise. We see a downgrade. We see a downgrade. We're not holding to a standard of purity. We're not holding to a standard of the word of God. And therefore, we see the world in a place (laughs) like we see right now. Purifying love holds to the standard. The third thing is that, and this will be the last one I talk about today, is that love protects. Love has a responsibility to protect. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, the word says, But the Lord is faithful and will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. The Lord is faithful and will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. That word evil in the Greek is ponieros. That word translates to annoyances, hardships, perils. Perils to the Christian faith causing pain and trouble. Of bad nature or condition, diseased or blind, and wickedness. In the original text, the word one is not even mentioned. So how it's, how it's uh, penned in the original text, it says, the Lord is faithful and will strengthen you and protect you from all evil. It's not just the one. Like God loves us enough to protect us. Amen? He loves us enough to protect us. Again, the definition of the word. To protect us from what? From annoyances, hardships, perils, perils to the Christian faith, causing pain and trouble, bad nature or condition, diseased or blind, wickedness. God loves us enough to offer protection. And guys, our love to those around us and the world around us should be a love that protects, that protects the values that God's heart beats for. That's what, a love, that's what the love of Christ in the body of Christ should look like. That our love that protects, it would protect the things that are near to God's heart. We have a a responsibility, church, friends, family. We have a responsibility as followers of Christ to guard and protect the things that his heart yearns for. In the natural, the love I have for my family would cause me to go to great lengths to protect them. I mean great lengths to protect them. As a, as a good father and a husband, I will do whatever necessary to protect my wife and kids. I will do whatever is needed to protect their safety, their innocence, their feelings, their heart. I will do whatever I can to protect my family. And guys, compared to him, I'm evil. That's what Matthew 7 says. Compared to him, I'm evil. So how much more... How much more than we, how much more than, 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 than could our love protect? How much more does his desire and love for us protect us? And kind of as I'm coming to this close here, I want us to understand that one of the ways that love protects us is that it sets up parameters. How many of you guys know that parameters are for your benefit? They're for our benefit. Whenever our boys were little, we lived in a house in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was a bi-level house. And in our living room, there was a gate and, uh, that, that, that stopped the kids from going downstairs. We didn't let our babies crawl around next to an open flight of stairs. Not because we were mean. <laughs> Not because we didn't want our kids to exercise their freedom to play on the stairs. No, we didn't let our kids roll around next to the stairs because we loved our kids and wanted to protect them. It wasn't us being mean or or trying to keep something from them. We loved our kids enough to protect them. God loves us enough. He loves the world enough to set parameters around us, not to keep us from anything, but to set us free to have everything he's called us to. Parameters are important, but here's the thing. Boundaries are established to protect, not restrict. But many have failed to see love's responsibility to protect. And as a result, the enemy has perverted God's protection into oppression, creating rebellion. That's how the enemy works. The enemy always tries to 
to pervert the purity from which God loves us. It's true. Many have failed to see love's responsibility to protect. And again, as I said, the enemy has perverted God's protection into oppression, creating rebellion. Sadly, the world around us has broken the boundaries that God has lovingly set, believing the enemy's lies and calling that freedom. Isn't that what we see? The world has broken the boundaries, boundaries, the word of God that he so lovingly established. The boundaries of the word, the boundaries for God, for, for, for life, love, happiness, for all things, righteousness, holiness, set up in his word. And the world has neglected these boundaries and said freedom is not found in the boundaries that God has ordained. Freedom is found outside. And that's how the enemy has always worked. That's what Satan did in the very beginning. When Satan came to tempt Adam and Eve, the first thing he did was get them to question the word of God. Did God really say? The next thing that he did was he tried to get them to question the heart of God, the motive of God. Well, God doesn't want you. God, God knows that if you eat that, you're going to be just like him. You see, if you eat that fruit, then God's just going to rule over you. He's going to keep you oppressed. He's going to keep you down. There's not freedom. Really, you're not free if you're, if you're not eating that fruit. And as a result, Adam and Eve stepped outside of the boundaries that God lovingly placed around them to protect them and tried to find freedom outside of the will of God. And friends, right now, that's where we find our world. That's where we find much of the world around us, even in Southern Illinois. People trying to find freedom outside of the boundaries that God lovingly has placed around us. Freedom, true freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom alone is found living in accordance with the will of God over your life. That's where freedom is. And we, family, have a responsibility, have a responsibility to love like God. To love, to love in such a way that we would protect the things that God calls good. That we would protect and value life. Amen? That we would protect and value those whose innocence is being ripped away. Guys, we have a responsibility to stand according to the will of God, not making excuses, but to take an active role in partnering with God's heart, loving well, protecting the things that God calls holy and dear. We have something to do. There is work to be done. And guys, I'm, I'm, man, I'm so excited. You know, we're seeing some things happen. And right here in southern Illinois, a ministry is being established, Restoration 61. A ministry that is literally set up to, to bring safety, security, to, 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 to rescue women and children who have been in the sex slave industry, who have been trafficked. That's being set up right here in southern Illinois because it's real. It's, it's happening. That's a good thing because God cares about these people. That's a good thing. Love protects. What a benefit it is to see the things that God is doing and to say, oh, that's what love looks like. Love doesn't look like blind acceptance and calling it good. Love pulls, love purifies, and love protects. Church, we are called to love. As he is, so we are in this world. We are called to demonstrate the love of God and to do it well. Pulling people out of the pit, loving them well, loving with a love that would purify, bring a purity to the things we see going on around us, and love that would protect the things that God values in Jesus' mighty name. Would you stand to your feet with me as we dismiss this morning? Would you raise your hands and let me bless you? Father, I thank you for your heart. I thank you for the work that you are doing 
in our lives, for the work that you are doing in your people. This morning, right now, God, I pray that you would teach us to love, that you would teach us to love well. Lord, that your love would be so real in us and that we would, we would move with this, with the heart and responsibility to love like you. So God, show us, show us how to love with a love that pulls. Show us how to love with a love that purifies and show us how to love with a love that protects for your glory and for your kingdom come, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now with hands raised, may the Lord Jesus bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May you walk in his favor, receiving and expressing the love of God well. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, 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 amen. Have a great week, everybody.